for. Well, it's really great to be here this morning with you guys. Um, there's something really special here today that I, I can't really define, but I'm just joyous to be here and to be able to share the study from this morning and uh, also allow us to reflect a little bit on the parable. Sometimes we don't read a lot of the parables that are in the Gospel according to Spiritism or um, any other books that we choose but or, or sites, but it's pretty amazing how much we can get from trying to understand the parables. And so this morning, um, uh, the Conscious Living offered an opportunity to review and study and analyze the parable of the talents and what it means and what we can take away and how we can reflect uh, upon ourselves with the parable of the talents. So here is the, uh, the chapter, it's chapter 16, the Gospel according to Spiritism. And the main aspect is you, it, it's about wealth and about employing the, the riches that we are given. And the topic is you can serve both God and Mammon. Now a lot of people don't know who Mammon was. I remember when I was 14 and I first read that, I said, wow, who is that guy, right? What is, who is Mammon? And in reality, here we have a definition in the painting that I thought was pretty cool to bring. It was done in 1909. The mammon in the New Testament of the Bible is material wealth or greed, most often personified as a deity and sometimes included in the seven princes of hell. So here's a, the painting of the worship of mammon. Um, the parable or this aspect here will focus on the employment of wealth and, and as the Gospels say, the providential usefulness of riches. But when we read about the parable, we will find that there are different aspects in which we can apply this in our daily lives and not just to do with power and riches. And this is what we are going to see here today. So here is the parable. I know. <laughs> I wanted to bring because it's actually chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. It's item 6 of the Gospel according to Spiritism. And it's pretty long, as we can see, and of course we don't have enough time to break each part, each verse, but we are going to zoom in on some uh, of it that we felt that would be important for us to analyze and understand. Good morning. Come on in. I really like to go back uh, to the beginning verse and then carry on reading to find out what was it about, what was going on there. And uh, interestingly enough, in the Gospel of Matthew, the chapter continues with the well verse known to some of you here who study the New Testament. Um, you guys remember after you say, inherit the kingdom for, prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me food, for I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. Remember that? And, and, and the verse goes on talking about how people who were able to do this, because they were doing it directly to the master, they would inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, if we look at the very last phrase of this parable here, it says, Let that useless servant be cast into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and clenching of teeth. And then Matthew continues on presenting the next par portions or the next verses talking about the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven and how Jesus will say, every time you did something good, it's as if you were doing unto me. So while they're talking about the talents and how we are supposed to make use of our talents in service of others, he continues on talking about the need to be charitable and the need to be of service to others constantly as if we were to Jesus himself. And the one person who actually was able to understand that, that comes to our mind in offering an example, is Mother Teresa. Nobody here have to compare themselves to Mother Teresa, but there is a pretty beautiful part in which she actually was able to help a dying man. He was filthy, he was hungry, and there was no cure for him, there was no healing for him. And she took care of him, she bathed him, she gave him clean, clean clothes, she fed him and she offered him a bed for him to die with dignity. And when he looked at her and he said, what is your religion? She said, you are my religion. Because when I see you, I see God. And this is as close as I can understand to the continuance of this parable here that we are not gonna get into it right now. If we look 
into the parable, here's where we're going to start zooming in and breaking in, we are going to find some interesting points that in reality has to do with the pursuit of our happiness and our spiritual growth. Because as we spiritually grow, we find the essence of true happiness and what that means to us. First, much like the servant of this parable, we are all given a starting position. Right away, this is what we're going to say. So the Lord acts like a man who, upon having to make a long journey outside his country, called his servants and placed his property in their hands. And having given five talents to one, two to other, and another, and one to another, according to each one's different abilities, he departed immediately. This is how the parable begins. So from here, we are going to decide in a green group, and you have no choice, that we are all given different starting positions in our life. Some of us have the abundance. We can compare ourselves to the servant who was given five talents. Other of us are given uh, a more scarce reality, so we'll call it the one talent. But whether we were given five, one, or two, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the quantity. In reality, we are going to find out that the parable has to do with what we have done with the talents. Our starting positions, our starting conditions is irrelevant in this case. And this is the beautiful part of it. In here, we are going to find that the person who got five talents, the one who got two, and the other who got another, who got one here, we're gonna, we're not gonna go forward yet, don't do it else. We are going to find that regardless, regardless of what they were given, regardless, all of them will be congratulated equally because we are going to find out that the one who got five and was able to multiply, or the one who got two and was able to multiply, although the quantity is different, the consequence and the quality will be 100% gratified. And this is what we are going to talk about here. So if you are sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm above average, I have five talents. I am in a position where I am in abundance. Don't pat yourself in the back yet because the return is gonna to have to be greater than that, the one who was given to. According to each one's ability is what we are going to find out here. There's going to be times in our lives where we are going to be given one talent or some of us were already born with that and we realize the difficulties and, and the challenges that we are faced. So what the parable teaches us is that we should do the best of it that we can with what we have been given in order to multiply. Let's find out exactly what this means. The Spiritist teachings will offer us some explanations on the parable of the talents. And some are different from one another, but the one that I really liked and I appreciated is in a book that hasn't yet been translated. It's called Therapeutic Parables from Alito de Seiqueira. It's one of his very first, first, first books, so it's pretty good. Uh, and the analysis that he makes is that he says that the three servants, the one who got five, the one who got two, the one who got one, and what they did with this represents our society today. So they're broken into two different types of service. Those who make up our society who are diligent, who are hardworking, who carry out their tasks as expected, and those who neglect what they are expected to do. It's interesting that he says this because even in the parable, Jesus offers us two different conditions, two different types of possibilities that we can choose from in dealing with the talents that we have been given. We can be like the good servant, we can be like the one who is the negligent one. They, they use the word bad as we're going to see uh, later on. But what caught our, our attention most here is this, according to each one's different abilities. It's the one thing that really stuck out when we were reading this. Emmanuel, the spirit author in the book, Paul and Stephen, in the very beginning of the book, says something that called my attention in trying to bring the parable of the talents to, to our study today. Who here has read the book, Paul and Stephen? Okay, if you haven't, this is one of those must read type of things for 2014. It's an amazing, amazing book. But in the preface of the book, it talks about people who compare themselves to Paul and how they feel that they are insignificant or unworthy or unable to accomplish what Paul did. But then he will come to us and he'll say that in our current world, this is what he says, 
There is a tendency towards spiritual idleness and displays of least effort. This is how he starts out by saying, he says, the fact is that Paul did indeed have his own divine ministry, but who in this world does not have a ministry from God? If we have a ministry, it's something that we have to manage. And this is pretty important when we understand the parable of the talents. He goes on to say, many will say that they do not know what their particular calling is, that they are ignorant in the respect. However, we will answer that besides ignorance, there is neglect and much pernicious caprice. Those who are more exacting will remark that Paul received a direct call from God, but in reality, all ordinary men and women have been personally called to serve Christ. Now, I thought this was pretty fitting for our parable of the talents because it's talking about a comparison. There is a person who did a study, and Ivan was the one who brought it to my attention, the comparison trap, and how we entrap ourselves and we start comparing ourselves to other people, and what they're able to accomplish and what we're not able to accomplish, and how some people are greater than what we are. But then Emmanuel will come lovingly, reminding us that we have all been called upon to serve. That's one of the things that is pretty interesting. He says, the summon, the form may vary, but the essence of the summon is always the same. So whether we have been given five, two, or one talents, what he's telling us is the essence is divine because it's from God himself. So even though the form may vary in accordance with our own capability and ability to carry out our task, the essence will be the same. It's divine. And so here he gives us a picker-upper, if you will, giving us an idea, a reminder of our true essence, that we are capable of, of doing great things. In the in, this, in, the, in the beginning phases of the spirit, we have learned that we were created in a state of simplicity and ignorance. Yes, we've, re we've read that in the spirit's book. Those who participate in our study group of, uh, on, on uh, Wednesdays will know this. And so created in a state of simplicity and in ignorance, we are taught that our incarnations, that the present reincarnation will offer us means, ways of reaching and achieving the spiritual ascendancy that God doesn't give us qualities. He offers us ways for us to acquire them through our own effort, without falling into what Emmanuel calls the idleness, the tendency of spiritual idleness, that we are able to effortlessly, effortless, to, with effort to work on behalf our, of ourselves. He will also say that it's one of the biggest, the biggest, um, uh, my God, I forgot the word out completely, Portuguese or English. Uh, caramba, I am so sorry. One of the biggest, biggest offerings or example that we have or notion that we have of God's love is exactly the fact that we have reincarnation to offer us the means and ways of getting this. But he will also say that because God is loving and justful and merciful, full of justice, full of justice else you, he will say that he will always give it to us in accordance with how much we can take and how much we can do. Now, if the, the form will vary and the essence of the summit is the same, it's always going to be in accordance with what we can do. God wouldn't be just if he was to give us more than what we could carry it out. Let me give you an example of this. If talents can be compared to infinite resources that we have available for us to ascend, in various books of Andre Lewis, he will bring us an example of this. For instance, in the book, The Messengers, this woman comes to the coordinator uh, talking about her reincarnatory plan. She has it all drawn out, what will happen to her. Not what will happen, but the means and the ways and the resources that she will have available for her to carry out her next incarnation. And she complains. She said, I have a complaint to make. I wish to change something. And I was like, well, what do you wish to change? She says, well, in here, it says that among other type of conditions, I will be born beautiful. I don't want to be born beautiful because in all of my previous existences, I utilize my physical beauty for the excessiveness of sensuality, of using people, of not actually being able to carry out the duty. So I wish to go in a less favorable physical, um, favorable condition less attractive so that I don't attract the other type of vices that I did in the past. It's pretty interesting her request because we can consider somebody to be 
physically beautiful, somebody who is able to speak well, like Angelina Jolie, for instance, should be able to utilize that, be pleasant, call attention to people, attract them to do the work for someone else. What does she do? She's a United Nations ambassador. She works for the benefit of other people. And here's a beautiful lady who will go and talk about it and use her fame, her talent, to be of service to others. Here's somebody who understood what, what the usefulness of her talents are. So this is just so, us, so we can try to understand here. And here are other examples. Here's what we uh, have the outcome of the people who utilize their talents, those who went out and gained five more, or the one who had to gain two more. And then we have the one here that we're focusing on, the one who dug a hole in the ground and his, his lost money. But here are examples that we have of people in our current society who used their talents in order to serve others. Here's Martin Luther King's question, what the life's most persistent energy question is, what are you doing for others? This man who knows him, Nick, is outstanding. Now this guy suffered with his disability in the beginning of his life, even questioning and arguing with God. How could he allow him to be born that way? And what is he doing today? He utilizes his talent to talk about the one he used to condemn in the beginning of his life. He talks about God's grace. He talks about how God is utilizing him so that he can be God's arms and legs in the world. This is a very positive outview that he utilizes. He has a family of his own. He's married, has a baby, as we can see here. And add him on Facebook. Every single day there is something positive that he uses out of his fame. He is a man who utilizes his voice for the beauty, for allowing people to ascend, for the feelings to be touched. If you haven't been to a concert by Andrea Bocelli, this is a guy who can't see people applauding him. He can hear them, but he can't see, he feels. Now, he could have used his voice for something bad. He's got, a, he's got his own nonprofit organization that he allows for some of the money that he makes to go to, towards too. So here's another type of service. And of course, we've already mentioned Angelina Jolie and what she's doing with her faith and with her talent and the faith and belief that she has that she should be in the service of others. In our present reincarnation, we can bring it here uh, in certain fields, you know, people who are in the field of medicine and ask what are they doing? Are they using their talents to save lives? Or are they doing it to destroy, promoting euthanasia, abortions, non-judgment in any way? But we have to bring these questions here. If we're given intelligence, are we promoting it, putting it into service to come up with ways where we can benefit, make it benefit for others? Are we using it this way? We see kids, the new generation of kids that are being born, that are highly intellectual, already finishing college level uh, classes in high school, that are looking for ways to promote ways of uh, coming up with clean drinking water for less fortunate countries. I've read uh, about this, this girl who was able to do this and, and so many other things where they're hoping to come up with cure for cancer and so many other uh, illnesses out in the world. So the problem with the talent, the one who has been given a talent, is a problem that we have to bring it to ourselves. Are we burying and hiding our talent? What does this mean in today's world? Our capacity to work, our capacity to utilize our intelligence, taking care of our family. If we've been given a family where we are, ab we are able to grow from love, are we neglecting our responsibility and running away from our responsibilities, or are we truly there? doing what is expected of us, taking care of our body. People don't often realize how much they should be taking care of their body as well. Nowadays, there's more people more uh, aware of the need to take care of their body and even the, the use of power and money, which is what the chapter focuses on. Power can also be seen here in maternity and paternity. People who have kids have power over their kids. What do they do with this power? People in the company, who own a company, how do you treat your employees? What do you do? Do you humiliate or do you act like a leader, allowing them to grow professionally and personal? So these are questions that we can ask here. On another case, we decided to bring an example of somebody who utilized his talent negatively. And, and, and the interesting uh, thing about Leo Tolstoy is that he wasn't always somebody who was 
you know, living in a society, uh, if you read a little bit about him, he had a very strong calling um, for, uh, you know, he married his wife because of their sexual uh, uh, com compatibility. It wasn't really out of love. And it came a point in his life where he felt empty. He felt that he didn't really want to carry it out that way anymore. He was writing some pretty interesting work. Uh, some of you know Anna Kar Karenina, the movie. You know, and this is, uh, uh, right before he died, he started having some moments where he felt that he didn't want to live that way anymore. And he invited his wife to, to um, live in a different way. And she decided that she wanted to be near the high society. And so he secluded himself to have a more spiritual awakening. And I think it's interesting because as soon, after he died, in realizing that some of his work led people to commit suicide, that his talent wasn't utilized for the correct way, in the spiritual plane, he decided that he wanted to come back and rectify some of the things that he had done with his lit literature. So he approaches Yvonne Pereira, who is a medium. Uh, two of her books have been translated. One of them is called Memoirs of a Suicide, because Yvonne Pereira had committed suicide many times in previous existences. And so she comes to this new existence hoping to allow other people to see the consequences of committing suicide and taking one's life. And so she attracted the, the, this spirit, not only the one who worked with her on Memories of Suicide, but Leo Tostoy. And he writes a book with her in trying to rectify the talent that he used incorrectly by writing in a Karenina, and trying to also bring a literature that would now compensate for alerting people on the need to maintain their lives, to not commit suicide. So we see that sometimes this awakening happens in the spiritual world. We get to the other side and we realize that we didn't use our talent correctly. And we ask to rectify. So when we look at our current situation of the world today and we see a lot of apparent injustices, we question, where does this all come from? People who are born with physical disabilities, who financially struggle, who don't have a family, who are unable to have children, where does this all come from? And why have these opportunities been taken away from them? What were these people doing with their given talent? What are we doing with their present talents? And this is what we are going to ask here. So it's a beautiful story and I really, really appreciate if you guys have the time to search for this and talk to us about later. I really love the turnaround of Leo Tostoy and realizing what he could do with his talent. Here we have the continuation of our parable. Sometime later, the servant's master returned. So here we're talking about a period of time that had passed by. What could be this sometime later applied to? We just talked about this, a reincarnation. So let's say we die, some time passed by, and we are called to give an accounting. Now we have learned in other parables that to give an accounting, to be turned over to the judges, really means our own conscience. We review what we have done or have not done. The one who had received five talents came and presented him five more saying, Master, you place five talents in my hands. Here are five more that I have gained. His master responded, You good and faithful servant, since you have been faithful in a small matter, I will entrust you with many others. Look how interesting. He says the same thing to the one who completed two because he actually multiplied, giving it 100%. But the one thing that also catches our attention here is entrusting you with many others. Of course, if the one who was given more talents are the ones who are able to, through their own spiritual ascendancy, acquire a position where they're able to carry out more responsibilities, when they're able to do it, they grow, they actually are able to be entrusted with other talents. It's what they're able to do. The other one who received two, received the same answer. Now, even though five is more than two, we have to remember that once again, both of them 100% were able to complete their tasks. And then he says, the one who had received only one talent came and said to him, Master, I knew that you are a hard man. So what does he do psychologically? He starts putting blame, putting the blame onto the master. A lot of people will do this. They will say that they were born in a less favorable condition 
They spend their entire life complaining about what they don't have instead of focusing on what they do have and what they can do with the small or little that they have. Who reaps where you have not sown and gathers where you have not scattered. Thus, since I was afraid of you, this is also important and I don't know why it's not highlighted, you hid your talent, I hid your talent in the ground. Here it is, I'm returning what is yours. So it's pretty significant here uh, because we see the two different and distinct reactions from both servants. And we've already talked about this in the beginning. There is the one who diligently worked to multiply the talent and in return receiving more where in the future incarnation they were able to receive, to carry out, to grow. And then the one who out of fears hides the talents. Now his fear of what would have happened to him if he had not carried out, ended up happening anyway, because he was put to blame. This is how we're gonna say it this way. It's a very erroneous idea. One of the things that we have to remember is, had the servant not been afraid and utilized that talent, what if he had multiplied, right? What if he had failed, but at least he tried? In Spiritism, in, in the presence of Chico Xavier, we we'll say that there is no punishment in Spiritism. There are consequences. So the, the consequences for his action for not having at least tried to manage and multiply that talent is actually what ends up happening with the negligent service. But he attributes his unhappy failure to service, to fear, excuse me, to being afraid. He received less potential to realize a profit, and he compared himself to the others. This is something else he did, and this is something that we do. It's a mistake that we often do. So, Emmanuel in the book, Living Spring, will say, similar to what happened to the careless servant in the gospel narrative, there are many people who blame their meager resources for not being able to do what they want. So they remain idle, and they say that they're afraid to do anything. Here's the word again, idle. Emmanuel in the book, Paul and Stephen will talk about the current society and how we fall into spiritual idleness. And here he talks about some of us who will remain idle in saying that we are afraid to do something. And this is very common in our society as well. And we have to ask if we are those who are placing ourselves in a position of fear, remaining idle, paralyzed in our pathway towards spiritual ascension. The Master answered him, you lazy and evil servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. Thus, you should have at least put my money in the hands of the banker so that upon my return, I could have withdrawn with interest what was mine. There are ways to see this, but one that was uh, kind of interesting was, was, was uh, in a lecture that somebody mentioned that when they say you should have given to, someone, to a banker means that if we're not able to execute our talent, perhaps allowing someone else to or work with someone else so that they can carry it out. So if my fear of speaking in public and it's a talent I have, I would allow Susanna to do it so that the work can be multiplied in service of others. He goes on to say, let this one talent be taken from him and be given to the one who has ten. For those who already have more will be given and they shall have in abundance. This is something interesting as well because whenever, God bless you, we place ourselves in the position of service, the abundance that we receive also is the assistance from the high spiritual world. Nobody is placed in this world to carry out certain duties, sometimes really hard, that makes us fearful without having the presence of the good spirits encouraging us and guiding us and giving us the needed support. And this is something that we have to start believing in. For him who has nothing, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. This is what was said here. Let that useless servant be cast into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and clenching of teeth. Now, I found this to be pretty harsh, right? But we just have to take a look at our world today, a world of trials and expiations, a world where people come and they're going to be tested, a world where they're going to be expiating for things that they did or did not do in the previous existence. Consequences of their actions, never punishment, is what we are going to see here. So, Alirio de Cerqueira Filho calls our attention to the word fear with a servant, where he felt fear. 
And he says that in the parable, the fear represents how people see themselves today, unable to carry out certain tasks, unworthy, people who have a very low esteem on their ability, or also in believing that they are divine, that the tasks or talents, whether they're meaningless to their eyes, but grand to the eyes of the master, if they should just multiply that one talent, they don't believe that they're able to do. And this is something that also caught our, talent, our attention because when we hide our talents, our fear of not being able to carry out, we actually let the opportunity of growth pass us by. And this is something that sometimes we don't think about. Sometimes we think that we are in a very accommodated position where we're not gonna try to do that which is right in front of us and in reality, we are letting an opportunity pass us by of growth. And this is also pretty um, significant when we see this here. The, the place of darkness where there's going to be weeping and clench of teeth, in reality, reminds me of our current world today. Who here sees only beautiful things in our planet? Right? People in um, the, the balance of wealth and poverty, impoverished places, People with physical disabilities, mental disabilities. I mean here to use that gentleman, uh, Stephen Hawkins. You guys know him? He's a genius, but he's completely immobilized. His spirit is there, thinking freely, but his body limits him. God knows what might have happened for that kind of consequence to be called upon him. But he's still utilizing his talent, whether it's good or not, it's his opportunity and he's not letting it pass by. Which is something else that we have to be careful of judging people for what they're doing or not doing. And when in reality we should be paying attention to what servant we are and what we're doing instead of judging and putting blame onto other people as well. So if you had just focused on the outcome instead of the problem, perhaps you would have multiplied. And so we bring it here. When we focus on the problem instead of the outcome, should we just try to resolve it, we also become paralyzed. Similar to what happens to the careless servant in the gospel narrative, there are many people who blame their meager resources for not being able to do what they want to. Emmanuel here, we're just re repeating. So they remain idle and they are, said to, they are afraid to do anything, afraid of working, Afraid of serving, of making friends, afraid of being disappointed. This is a big one. Who hasn't been disappointed before? Afraid of suffering, which is okay too to feel this way. Afraid of being misunderstood, of even happiness. Now we can take a look today and say that our present reincarnation is a collection of every past lives that we have had. So it's okay that we should be able to feel this fear. He says, under the pretext of being disfavored by faith, they gradually become champions of useless, uselessness and idleness. And then Emmanuel will say that the excuse of being afraid didn't work for the master, and it won't work on our behalf either. That we have to find the faith and courage to execute what is before us. And so I really love this message here. We are taught that we would never be allowed to reincarnate here, even though we may be afraid of all of this here without the assistance needed for us to carry out our tasks, without the resources that we need. And so Emmanuel will say, if you have received a harder task in the world, don't be afraid. Make it your way of progress and renewal. Make the difficult situation your own personal way of progress and renewal. No matter how dark the road to which circumstances have led you, enrich it with the light of your effort doing good. Being good, being afraid was not an acceptable excuse in settling accounts between the servants and the master, and it won't be for you either. Now, there are many ways in which we can answer to the callings and the talents that the, that the master has presented upon us, and the good spirits will tell us that there are other ways that we can be of service. While we are afraid of all of this, the good spirits in the gospel according to spiritism, the, intelligent, uh, the mission of the intelligent person in the world will say that just by being in the presence of other people, we have an ability to put our talent and multiply it. 
Because if we're in the presence of people, we have an opportunity to do something good. Who here hasn't been in a situation, the spirit is sent, or we look to the side, we see somebody in tears, we're able to offer a helping hand. If we see a beggar in the street and we are afraid to give them money because they might use it for drugs, we can give them food. We can give them a sweater if it's cold. We can always be in service of others applying our talents. And so the infinite resources that they tell us around so that we can execute our personal growth. Now, he will say that even though we will be called upon to give an accounting, this also means that we have to learn how to manage. If we are serving, if we have been a, given a talent to utilize it, we have to learn how to manage. And we are going to answer for that as well. He will say, each person is a servant because of his or her endeavor in the work of the Supreme Father. And at the same time, a manager because he or she is the holder of enormous potential in the sphere in which he or she toils. Each intelligent being on earth, that's all of us here, will have to account for the resources that we have been interested upon us. Whether it's money, whether it's in the family life, if it's a difficult situation that we have been given to work through it as the presence of one talent, whatever the case may be, he will remind us that we have to also manage that talent that we have been interested upon. A reminder that wealth and authority are also in that category, of course, the entire chapter 16 talks about this, but he will say that we also have to manage and give an account about the physical body as our sacred temple and how we are treating it, our physical health as a treasure, the opportunity of work, which is a blessing and a lot of people run away from, and the immeasurable patrimony of our own lives. And he will finalize saying that so that what we have been doing with the invaluable talents that lie within our hearts, in our hands, in our pathway. He's asking, what are we doing with it? Look after your own endeavor for the good before the eternal one, because a time will come when the divine power will say to you, give an account of your management. So this is our study for this morning.